a great course, um, such a great trip that that uh, goes far and beyond what you're able to experience as a mere tourist. Now, I've started the video, and uh, did we agree that Jazz would say a few words first, and then we would go to Mark? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. My mic's off. Yeah, we can do that if you like. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Go for it. So I'm Jazz, and I just um, I've been on the trip to South Africa this year, and there's so much I could say about it. Honestly, from the people that I met to the places we stayed, um, to the things we did. I mean, it's endless. But I mean, we're all going there for the animals, really. So I thought I'd show you just a few pictures that I took while on the trip, um, and talk a little bit about what we were doing when I took those photos. So I just want to share my screen quickly. Um, here we go. So can you all see that? Yep, we can see it fine. Perfect. So this was the first day um, that we went out on safari and it was like the most amazing experience. This is um, a young male who we helped um, relocate so that was an absolutely once in a lifetime experience and it was so amazing we went out on the trucks and at this point we were paying playing noises of pigs squealing to attract them to try and find them and it was honestly yeah it was amazing you can see how close we were I don't have the biggest lens on my camera so yeah you can really see how close we were um some of the larger animals that we saw as well um the zebra we saw at the first place we went to and the giraffe was part of a big project that's going on at Zingela, which i'm sure you will hear about um and the elephants as well that we saw down in saint lucia which were amazing any um bird lovers out there you are in for a treat because <laughs> there are lots of amazing birds and i was so excited about this and yeah it was really cool the colors that that you see out there are just nothing like you see in the uk um so yeah that's another thing to look forward to um some of the more um i don't know unusual looking animals but i just love them so much this little rain frog was one of the highlights of the trip i just couldn't believe it uh, i was so excited <laughs> when i saw him um and this was the rain frog was at Zing Zingela safaris as well, which which was just uh, just amazing. Um, and then some more pictures of the lions as well, because they really were a highlight. Um, and these pictures just show how close we were able to get really to the animals and the amount of different animals we saw. It was just incredible. Um, you always see pictures videos of people on safari in the back of the jeep and you just never really think it's going to be you and then <laughs> you do it and it's just it's just incredible and yeah um i'm sure there'll be time to ask questions at the end but like i said i could say loads but i just yeah leave it there for now thanks jazz uh i actually just dropped a picture in the chat too of um you know, we do more than just viewing from the vehicles. We get to get out of the vehicles. And that's this was taken on the same day as those young male lions in the tree. And those are our students in the back of that pickup truck. And if that looks alarming to you, we had a full health and safety briefing before it happened uh, with instructions not to step on testicles and tails. And uh, they were in the truck with complete safety with the lions. Um, Mark, can I hand it over to you and tell us a little bit about what to expect on this trip? Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Ed, and thank you, Jazz, for, for your lovely pictures and uh, some stories about the trip. So, um, yeah, welcome, everyone. Um, so my name is Mark, um, and I head up Gap Africa Projects here in the UK. Um, and as Ed said, we kind of put on the, the trip uh, for the university. Um, not just isolated to Harper, we work with many, many different um, universities and colleges across the UK, um, sort of piecing together and tailoring these field trips 
uh, over to South Africa to go and work with our wonderful conservation partners over there. Uh, so we're running with Harper Adams now for a few years, and I think every year is he's getting better and improving. We're adding new little bits in. Um, so I'm hoping if if you do decide to to go in 2025, it will be an amazing experience for you, not just in the kind of academic sense, but really genuinely mean by a kind of life experience for you as well um, to get over there and experience it all. So I do have a presentation I, I'm going to run through with you. I'm hoping it shouldn't be longer than sort of 30, 35 minutes or so. Um, I do get a bit carried away sometimes, a bit over enthusiastic, so I apologise uh, if I do overrun. Um, but what it really I want to get across is just an overview about the project. So really explaining the kind of the fundamentals behind it, how it's structured, um, go into where the locations are um, and then just sort of run through some of the project activities you can expect to do. I just want to put a little kind of disclaimer out there now. This is an overview of the project. Um, every trip we send, you know, even ones from the same universities and colleges, you know, going back year on year, it will always be a very different experience. So it's difficult for me to obviously predict in 2025 exactly what's going to be taking place, but I'm hoping this should give you an idea of, of why we do what we do over there um, and what you can expect to, to get involved in. So I will just turn my camera off and share the screen. I hope it's come up for you guys there. OK, and we will go into the presentation. So this particular trip uh, that we're going to be hopefully running with you for next year um, is down in an area called KwaZulu Natal um, in South Africa. Um, and we structure the program in a way that it allows you to go and have a unique experience over in South Africa, living and working basically in the wild of Africa. And I'm going to run through the different locations that you'll be uh, spending the time with. Uh, when I say hands on wildlife conservation work, it is very much that. So, um, you know, we do have what we would call safari tourists um, at the different locations that would we'll be going out to see animals. But what we want to do for you is open the back door and show you all of the conservation work and management techniques that are used um, to maintain these wild ecosystems. So it is very, very much that. And I do just want to reiterate that it's not a holiday. It is very much a field trip. So long days, early starts, but we're going to expose you to so much stuff while you're out there. Focus on these three key areas. So we're learning about pioneer pioneering conservation research. Um, so that's learning about short and long term research objectives that we have at different properties. Conservation activities, getting out, getting your hands dirty, getting stuck in, learning what a conservationist in Africa does on a day to day. Um, and a very important part, which I will touch on as we go through the presentation, is cultural enrichment. You know, we, we can't have successful conservation uh, programs without involving the local community through empowerment and also uh, education. So we do that at all the projects that we support. And I'll explain a little bit about how that works. It's a full 13 days in South Africa. Uh, the trip is all inclusive and I'm going to come on to all those details right at the end. Um, but we basically cover everything for you. Just need to get yourselves over to the airport um, and then we basically have everything planned and organised for you from there. And in most incredible wildlife experience you'll ever have, uh, I have had that on my presentation now for over 12 years. And hopefully Jazz will be able to, to reaffirm that that is a genuine statement um, and my job is very difficult because I have to try and get this across in a PowerPoint presentation, which is nigh on impossible. So the actual program itself is split into two different areas. We've changed it slightly for next year because we feel that we can get more in terms of research out um, of these two locations. So it's two land based projects um, over the 13 days. So first part, you'll be visiting an area called Nambiti, which is our big five conservation area. So that's obviously learning about your larger mammals, species and how you manage and maintain the ecosystem for them. Um, and then, oh, sorry, that's a. Uh, that's a, a typo on there. It's uh, the second place is an area called uh, Zingela, which I'll explain a little bit about, and that's days eight to 13. Um, and that will be working over there, learning about some of the smaller research projects that we do. In terms of location, it's down in South Africa, as we've already stated, and this is just a quite a grainy screen grab <laughs> from flight radar, but I think it's quite nice just to show you exactly whereabouts you'll be heading down to. So our departures are on Sunday evening. You guys will be flying with British Airways direct from London Heathrow into Johannesburg, um, and that is pretty much the route that the flight takes overnight from, from Heathrow. So leaving on the Sunday evening, you expect to land kind of uh, sort of early mid morning uh, on the Monday. 
Uh, if you are interested, the flight time is about 10 to 10 and a half hours into Johannesburg. So it is a long haul flight, uh, but there's only two hours of time difference the time of year that you'll be traveling. So no real jet lag to contend with. Um, and just to give you, I was finding it absolutely amazing to give you an idea of how big the continent of Africa is, is during the flight, you normally hit the the, uh, the northern tip of the continent after about two two and a half hours of that flight time so the rest of that flying is is actually going over africa so it is a vast vast continent and you guys will be flying into the very southern tip into south africa which is the southernmost country there so the two circles that i've i've highlighted here uh, is johannesburg that's where you arrive into once you get there we meet you with a private coach get you on the road and then you head down to right into the heart of kwazulu natal there and that's where the two land-based projects are based so i would say leaving on a sunday you can expect to be on the project uh kind of mid to late monday afternoon so quite a lot of traveling but we'll get you settled into camp uh nothing too strenuous a bit of an introduction and then we'll go into the program uh the following day in terms of the sort of project now, we'll, we'll delve into some of the uh, the details about the two different project locations. But I just want to just touch on this little slide here, and it, I think it ties well um, with what Ed was saying about you know how it fits with your modules. So in South Africa, it's quite unique in terms of uh, your wildlife, your game reserves, your national parks, um, and how they work. So although South Africa and this map would suggest that you've got these vast areas. Uh, of um, you know wild conservation areas in true fact South Africa's uh, conservation areas are split up into lots of small fenced and confined game reserves or national parks um, and a game reserve is basically a large area of protected land where wildlife is free roaming in their natural habitat there's two types of uh, conservation areas you find in South Africa we have our national parks which are government owned government managed and then you have your privately owned um, game reserves of which the, the ones you'll be visiting um, are they have physical boundaries so electrified fences around them and these areas differ in size from anywhere from 3,000 hectares you know up to you know almost a million hectares in Kruger National Park so vast vast areas um, but they are all fenced therefore as soon as you put a physical boundary around a wild animal you are limiting things like population growth migration and natural resources so all of these areas no matter how big they are are managed and you have to then have research projects to back up those management decisions and that's what we're going to be showing you all about so yes all of these areas highlighted on the map are wild but they are all managed wild areas and, and that stems even into areas such as as the Kruger National Park as well hopefully that gives a, a bit of a, a kind of background as to to why we do what we do so first off you'll be heading down to Nambiti. So this is where we spend the first part of the program. This is our big five game reserve. Um, it's a pretty vast area. So about 23,000 acres of wilderness area. Um, and as I say, is home to the big five. So we have elephant, lion, leopard, rhino and buffalo free roaming coexisting um, at the reserve. And in, in terms of diversity, there's over 40 other species of mammal. Uh, that call now BT home. So a real kind of say diverse range um, of species. Um, also have a huge array of, of reptiles and uh, Jazz touched on it as well. Bird life, amazing. I think over 300 different species of bird life there, depending on the time of year, migration patterns and things like that. So it really is teeming with wildlife. Um, so you'll be spending a week there. Um, and obviously, as, as the picture suggested that Jazz was showing, you will see some incredible wildlife and have some amazing encounters. However, as I had stated at the very beginning, this is very much a field program as well. So we want you to learn as much as possible. So you'll actually be staying with the Man Nambiti research team. So just outside of the game reserve uh, on a small property, which is predator free. And that's where our research camp is. So you'll be living with these guys learning all about the work that they do, why they do it, and then they will be the ones linking you onto the main reserve itself uh, and getting you involved in all these different activities. You can see the types of vehicles we use. So at Nambiti, it's a, a mixture between on foot uh, practical exercises and then accessing the big reserve on these four by four vehicles, which obviously when we're viewing large dangerous animals are perfect open sided high vantage point so when we're out there these are really are the, the best kind of tools to be using uh, to be able to to find wildlife while we're there in terms of actual project activities 
the types of things that we'll introduce you to is uh, why we use and how we use telemetry tracking. So some of our higher profile species on the property will have tracking devices on them, which typically is a tracking collar, which you can see in the top right hand side there. Um, and each of those tracking collars are battery operated and they emit an individual frequency. And in this aerial that you can see in the various pictures here, um, this then picks up that frequency and just emits a very kind of dull uh, tone, but it's enough for us to be able to gauge which direction we need to be heading in, how close it is. It's fairly sophisticated, it has short range and long range on it, but it's very, very tricky to use. And, and what we want to do is teach you how to use it and how to use it properly. And these are actually some pictures from, from the group this year. Um, so you can see you have to get inventive sometimes, jump up on someone's shoulders maybe to get uh, a better signal. But this then allows us to get out into the reserve and find those species. You know, such a vast area just allows us to, to, to get the upper hand when we are tracking them. We also have some pretty amazing staff um, at Nambiti um, who are qualified field guides to a very high level, which means you will have the opportunity to go out and do an on foot trail as well. So we go out onto the reserve in smaller groups um, and we go and teach you all about track signs and spores, how we would go back to the tradi traditional way of being able to track these animals. And there's nothing quite like traversing through a, a large wilderness area on foot it's it's one of the things that you have to experience um i can't explain what it feels like but it is incredible so this is another amazing thing that we can do at, at nam bt it's not only introduce you to these guides uh, but actually get out there in the field on foot um, and go and delve into all the smaller details and in terms of some of the research stuff that we'll try and teach you about uh, things like habitat prey selection and uh, impact assessment of predators so we have lots of predators um, at Nambiti, you know, ranging from small sort of caracals, um, jackals and things like that. But we also have our apex predators as well. Um, so we have to keep a close eye on what they're doing. So lion, as soon as you put lion onto your game reserve, you have to keep a close eye on them because they are top of the food chain and left to their own devices. They will overhunt and they will overpopulate. And that is just that will just naturally happen. So from the very moment you put them on reserve, you have to be monitoring them and there has to be a, a research program in place. Um, we also not just in terms of their hunting habits, but also impact assessment. Uh, on other species and in particular cheetah the more line you have on your reserve the lower you'd expect your cheetah numbers to go so again we're trying to find that balance between uh, population uh, densities between the two so it really is quite fascinating and you know i i can tell you this but also jazz showed you some pretty awesome pictures uh, of the lion sighting so we are afforded with some pretty cool lion sightings and also cheetah as well and they both have tracking collars so we can go out and track them also started doing a, an impact assessment um, into the Ellies. So we've got a growing number of elephants um, at Nambiti, and we started at the beginning of last year doing a full on impact research assessment uh, into really kind of to try and tell us a story about right in a few years time, in five years time, you know, if these animals continue to you know, grow, expand in terms of population, you know, what can we expect to actually happen to the ecosystem? So it's really important that we do this. And I would say on par, maybe even higher than lions, your overpopulation of elephant can really cause a huge problem because it's just comes down to habitat loss for other species. So we really need to have this data in place for us to make informed decisions uh, further down the line. But we do get some pretty nice um, elephant sightings. And you can see the picture there is actually one from one of the lodges at, at the uh, at the game reserve so they do become a bit cheeky as well and come up and start drinking out the swimming pools and things so um yeah it uh, just shows kind of how we are mixed in with nature the whole time we also do some rhino monitoring so this is a, a really big part about nambiti um you know we do have rhino have both black and white rhino uh, reserve and we have some incredibly dedicated people uh, who have basically put their whole lives to keeping these animals safe. Obviously, poaching in South Africa is, is a big problem, uh, but these guys are there and they are the real heroes. They're the ones out there protecting, checking the fences and monitoring these individual animals um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So we'll hopefully get you up there in smaller teams, go up and, and meet the um, 
anti-poaching guys and the rhino monitoring team and we'll get you out there and we'll hopefully be able to see these animals um, in their natural habitat and what an absolute privilege it is to see them obviously you know endangered species particularly black rhino um, you know the numbers uh, were diminished they are coming back now which is great um, one thing as well, which you'll learn about while you're there about uh, the preservation of rhino. If you look in some of the pictures, and I think that top left one is probably the perfect example. And um, if you look at them, their horns, they've actually been um, sawn off. Um, and that is done pretty much throughout most of the game reserves in South Africa as a deterrent for, um, for poaching. So by taking the horn, you're hoping that there's nothing for the poachers to come after. It's very controversial and this will probably be an open debate that we'll have you know if you're taking that away from the animal you know are you then inhibiting their their ability to defend themselves and and those sorts of things so it is it is a you know sparks a big debate but it is one of those things that is important to uh to preserving these species we also do things like um herbivore assessments so in terms of their impact on vegetation so not quite as exciting maybe as going off and tracking lion and cheetah but again vitally important we need to understand about the grazing conditions at the game reserve you know what our carrying capacities are in terms of these grazing animals your predator prey ratios and those sorts of things and every sort of five years they'll do a huge um, uh, assessment where they bring in helicopters and planes and they do an aerial assessment um, and it's also then backed up by doing things like body scoring, health conditions, and that stuff that our team do, you know, on a day to day basis. We'll also introduce you to some of the camera trap stuff that we do. So this is obviously used uh, extensively for that reserve um, to, to help us understand more about your more sort of uh, rare and nocturnal species that Nambiti have that you wouldn't typically see, you know, being out in the day. So things like uh, leopard, um, you know, honey badgers, uh, you know, odd wolf, um, all of those sorts of things that we wouldn't typically see. Um, you know, the camera traps really do help open up this secret world of Nambiti that we don't often uh, get to see when we're out on the vehicles. Um, while you're there as well, we'll have the chance to do some night drives. Um, so we come back, have our supper, um, and then we go out uh, just as the sun's starting to dip down. Um, and we take our telemetry system with us and we go out, see what we can see. Although you're going on to this, exactly the same game reserve that you've been in the day, it's such a different environment. The nocturnal activity, you know, in the world of Africa is pretty amazing. Just the sounds alone um, is pretty awesome. So we we'll get out there and see what we can find. If we can and we know where they are, we'll always go and see if we can trap the lions. Uh, during the day, they are pretty pretty dormant in terms of activity but at night is when they really come alive and they're off the males break away they're doing their territorial uh, markings etc and then uh, you've got your, you know the females and the younger males that be off trying to hunt as well so we do have some pretty amazing night drives um, there so I would encourage you to uh, to take up the opportunity and then as was briefly mentioned as well um, you know this doesn't happen all the time but there are opportunities that present themselves um, for possible wildlife interventions. Um, and I'll give you an example of how these opportunities present themselves. When um, Ed and Jazz and the guys were in South Africa, I was actually in South Africa with my family, but in a completely different place. And I was sat by the pool and the conservation team from Nambiti uh, messaged me and said, look, we've got this opportunity. Do you think your group will want to be involved? Um, you know, can we get some donation towards the, the, the intervention? So your answer was obviously yes. And the next day, the guys are out and, and darting and relocating these lions. So when I say that sometimes the opportunity presents itself, it very much is like that. So the, these guys were incredibly fortunate to be involved in the intervention. Um, you know, be that close and personal with, uh, you know, these lions is, is pretty awesome and learning out about, you know, why and, and where they're going to as well. But there is other opportunities and, and this is just an example. So we, we do some mini uh, projects with you while you're there on in camp as well. Um, so our groups that went at the beginning of this year, we're helping out with the Ard Wolf project. Um, and then just to kind of home more on the educational side, you know, they each done their own sort of Ard Wolf posters and that was done with presentations at the camp as well. So just trying to give you a feel that it's not just like out in the reserve the whole day you know we also have time at the camp and and try and you know obviously fulfill some of the uh, the more academic based stuff um, as well and then just finishing up at Nambiti 
I want to mention the community projects, so you will visit some of our community projects while you're, while you're here. I did mention at the start, it's very important that we have these in place for the sustainability of conservation, but also these local communities too. So the culture that surrounds that area um, is Zulu. So it's all Zulu rural communities that, that border Nambiti. And the land is actually leased from the Zulu community. So it's actually owned by them and leased by Nambiti for, for conservation purposes. There's some pretty amazing projects that we do support. So uh, not limited to, but the, the main ones are Move Africa. Um, so these guys are fighting against period poverty, uh, providing resources and education to young girls um, who sadly most will miss, you know, at least a week of school every month just by not having access to basic, um, you know, uh, sanitary items. So they do an amazing thing. They go in and set these workshops up in the school and educate the, um, the young girls and provide them with reusable cups. Jabong hats is in one of the local communities and the, the go-go's or the grandmas have made these uh, hats out of recycled plastic bags. Go down there, have traditional lunch, learn all about what they do. And in Rhino Art, they empower local and young kids. They go in and set these art workshops up um, and really try and teach the kids about the importance of conservation. So just three kind of examples of the community stuff that you might do. but. I know you guys will very much go with your wildlife hats on, but I promise you the community days often on the feedback we get are, are the most popular days because it is such a rewarding day. And then just very briefly touching on it, we, we do recommend or try and encourage our groups, should I say, to take one of our donation bags down where we just try and upcycle stuff that we've probably got sat, sat at the back of our wardrobes that can quite easily be donated um, and, and used to good effect uh, by these communities. OK, so that's Nambiti. Now quickly just to touch on the second part of the programme, which is at Zingela, um, which is another wilderness reserve uh, very, very close by to, to Nambiti. But the activities here are very, very different. So Nambiti is your fenced big five, uh, your dangerous game area. So the management principles there are far different from Zingela, which is a non-fenced, non-Big Five property. So here we can delve into some much smaller research projects um, and learn all about the management of the ecosystem here as well, and also the troubles that they face and how they have to work with the local communities um, in their management plans as well. I think the big thing for, for Zingela is the river. We've got a fantastic river called the Tugela that runs through the heart of it, um, and we do get to use that to some effect as well, which is quite nice. Um, just to also mention, we will have um, quite an interesting way of getting you between the two camps. So as you can see, as crow flies, they're pretty close together. But if we had to drive you from Shimongwe, which is basically where the camp at Nambiti is, um, and around, it's going to take probably three hours plus. Um, Google Maps is saying an hour and 38, but it doesn't realise that from Colenso, it's four by four only. So it is. it takes quite a while to get into camp. So rather, there's a trail that's been mapped out. And there's two trails we can do, uh, one of which will pop us out on the banks of the Tugela and the other one takes us straight into camp. So we will see, depending on weather conditions and the size of the group, um, but we do a trail. We basically drop you off. Um, we take your luggage with us um, in the vehicles and then you just have your backpack and you go through this. It's between six to eight kilometres, depending which trail we do. And then you pop out um, into camp. If we do do the river trail, it means we pop out on the banks. The river guys will meet you there and then we actually have a paddle down the river and then you arrive into camp um, around about lunchtime and met by the Zingela team. So it's a pretty awesome way of getting between the two camps rather than just sat in the vehicle for three hours. We thought rather let's use that to best effect and, and to, you know, treat you to another you know, unique experience. Now, as mentioned, Zingela has some pretty unique um, uh, research projects, so I'm just going to touch on a few of them. One of the big ones at the moment is the giraffe migration and impact assessment. So Zingela being unfenced means it borders lots of other conservation and community areas, um, and it means that the range that these giraffe have is vast. You know, it's hundreds of kilometres. Um, and Peter, who's the owner, who's in the picture there, bottom sort of middle right, um, has taken it upon himself that he wants to do this ID collection of all the giraffe in the basin. So all of these migrating giraffe he wants to identify individually. So over the years, you know, through lots of work from our groups, we have managed to, to ID a huge amount of these giraffe. And I think the population is far greater than was anticipated. So 
Um, and there's also been a, a, um, a realization that the impact on where the giraffe are, um, you know, is quite high. So, and I know Jazz is is, is keen to, to help out with this as well, but there are talks with the local communities who have the land on the other side of the river about maybe relocating some of these giraffe onto the other side of the river uh, because the land there is, you know, it has not yet been impacted by these animals. So, you know, these these research projects, you know, are genuine and, you know, really, you know, are going to be ongoing. Then we do things like river assessments. Um, so we've got the, the Tugela. We put our nets out every day. Um, we draw them in around about lunchtime and then we'll teach you how we, you know, tag fish and re-release. Um, we're also doing a big freshwater eel project as well, which is really interesting, trying to understand about the life cycle using GPS data um, and tagging techniques as well. So this is a really nice thing. Again, like I say, uh, focusing on these smaller research projects. And then the time of year that you guys will be going will be summer. Um, so we will be doing some herpetology. Um, so we'll get um, either Philip, who's our herpetologist, or one of his uh, assistants uh, to come and spend some time in the group. We go off into the bush, we find an area, we'll show you how we set up these pitfall traps, um, and then we come back and we see what sp uh, specimens we've caught. Um, the following day, we normally do an early morning and then a, a, a later in the afternoon collection. Um, and then we take all the biometric data and things. But we can expect that, fe you know, February time, um, your reptile traffic is going to be pretty high. Um, so capturing all sorts of things from, you know, um, uh, snakes and, and all sorts of things. Um, then the other great thing about Zingela is because we don't have the dangerous animals here, it means that we're not restricted to the vehicles as much. So it does mean we can get off and do some amazing ecology and botany walks. Again, we've got some pretty fantastic guides here. Uh, we've got a chap called Scotty who worked for the National Parks Board for many, many years. You know, he gives a fantastic presentation um, on wildlife and, you know, medicinal values of plants and things. And then it's just get out there and explore and, and go and see what we can see and find what we can find. And then another couple of nice things we have here is um, so away from the research stuff, we do have some time for some adventure activities. So I mentioned about the kayaking or rafting um, on the day in. If we don't do it on the day in, um, then we can go off and do some whitewater rafting uh, during the time it's in Gala. So we tow the rafts up um, and we go up river and then we take a paddle down um, and we do have some whitewater rapids along the way so it can be quite interesting uh, nothing really above a 1.5 i think the highest grade you get is a five but even a 1.5 if you've never done whitewater rafting before can be can be pretty uh, uh adrenaline pumping so it's quite good fun uh, you can see the bottom picture there on the right hand side uh, that's kind of like your your training before we get in the rafts if someone was to come out um, i believe that's called the cocktail position you just point your toes downwards hold on to your life vest and, uh, and and just go down the river until the karma part comes before we then uh, fish you out again. But it sounds probably worse than it is, but everyone gets to go down the rapids if they want to uh, outside camp. Um, and there's also abseiling and rock climbing. So we've got a couple of abseiling points um, along the river. One of them, I think, is about 10 metres high. I it's, it's very, very high. Not my sort of thing. I'm scared of heights, but if you're feeling really adventurous, um, it might be for you and that's all included. There's no additional for that. Um, it's all included as part of the program. OK, and then coming on to accommodation. Um, so you guys will be staying um, at the camps at the two uh, different properties. So now BT camp is uh, very much a bush camp. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's not within the, the actual Big Five Reserve. It's, it's on an, a predator free part of the property just opposite where the main gate is, which is great because it means that we can safely kind of move around camp, not have to worry about anything too dangerous wandering around. Um, but it is very much a bush camp, so it's completely off grid. It's all tented as well. So you can see the aerial shot there. Those are our nice big communal tents. That's where we come together of an evening to, to have dinner and, and lounge and sit and relax. Um, and then you'll be staying in tents. There's different size tents. There are typically two or three people per tent. We do provide you with proper beds and bed linen, blankets, etc. Um, but I just think the way the camp set out is just it's it's so, so amazing. I think it's just so nice that way it blends in with the nature so you can see here this the, the the communal shop the aerial shot there 
and you've got these shale paths that kind of meander off into the bushes and then they sort of break away and you've got a tent down one end and then a couple of tents down the other um, so it really is basic but personally the best way to experience a program like this uh, we do have a proper ablutions though so that's an example bottom right looks pretty basic because it is but you have flushing toilets we have hot um, running showers as well but the difference here is they're completely open so they're in a part of the the camp where people can't see in but you can just have a shower in the mornings and look out listen to the sounds of africa while you're having a shower in the morning so uh, again takes a bit of getting used to but again it's such an amazing experience um, and then in terms of you know your your downtime it's a very uh communal um you know uh, camp so we all come together in the evenings we sit around the campfire uh, we talk we have presentations we encourage people to talk about their experiences as well so honestly this that's one of the things i can't explain like the camp life is amazing then heading over to zingela um there's different types of accommodation but i i try to say james's camp which is the tented camp because if you're not staying there it means you're staying in a nicer accommodation so we rather set the expectation lower um but it is tents again uh slightly bigger there's a variation of tent sizes again two or three people per tent proper beds bed linen provided the difference at zingela is we do have permanent parts of the camp that have been built as well so James's camp does have its own communal area, so uh, kitchen um, and like fire pit barbecue area and things. But then a short walk away from there is the main part of camp where there is a bar and where we'll come together in the evening as well and have dinners um, and they do presentations and things of the evening. So uh, it is an amazing camp. And again, I think what makes both of these places is the people the people you'll meet there you know this it's they almost welcoming you to their home um, and they'll make you feel very very welcome and camp life there's nothing quite like it to be quite honest and then food it will all provided for you so we can talk about this in much more detail closer to the time but breakfast lunch and dinner so breakfast is typically help yourself set out sort of continental style you know um teas and coffees toast um fruit um, and maybe a bit of a cooked breakfast somewhere along the way as well um, and then lunch is a normally light lunch so um, sandwiches hot dogs those sorts of things and then the evening meals homemade wholesome cooked food which is set up buffet style um, and the food is all homemade and it is fabulous yummy yummy flavors lots of it um, so please <laughs> don't be worried about food if that's a concern um, and we can cater for dietary requirements as long as we know about those um, then we'll cater properly for them and then just finishing up um, I think we were lucky to have Jazz at the beginning you know talking from personal perspective but that's something that I can't get over in in this PowerPoint presentation is the personal development that you'll get from this trip um, you know, I know it's built into your module and, and we're going to focus on the academic stuff, but I promise in terms of a personal experience and a personal takeaway, um, you know, it, it will it will change you <laughs> for, for want of a, a better way of describing it. And just from my perspective, because I'm very wary of being a, a middle aged man trying to, you know, <laughs> tell students about how life changing it was. This was me in South Africa. And similar to, to Ed saying about his experiences, you know, this was not my first time, but the first time I'd spent, you know, months out there doing proper field work. Um, I've done uh, guide training as well. And this was when I was 20. And that literally inspired a lifetime passion for Africa. Um, and now I get to do some amazing things, work with amazing people um, and set up and support these projects with them as well. So when I talk to you, I generally talk from a, a, a position of, of um, passion for what we do um, and hoping that you'll embark on a trip and, and also have one of those experiences. In terms of booking your trip, um, so the dates for next year are departure on the 19th of February arriving on the 20th and then you'll be in country for um, for those 13 days leaving on the 5th arriving back on the 6th um, the cost expected cost at the moment is around 2295 um, which I appreciate is a big chunk of change but it does include everything so hopefully when you break it down you'll see that it's actually good value so that's your return flights with BA it's the transfers to and from the projects all the accommodation, all your meals, and then all the activities. So basically everything is included. There's nothing additional there. 
Um, what's not included is personal travel insurance. I'll just need to, um, Ed, I'm sure Ed can uh, advise on whether that's included through the university, but if not, then you would need to get your own policy for that. Um, and there's some key deadlines I just want to highlight here. Um, I'm going to give you a link on the next page to a booking form and also we've set up a web page for you where you can access all the trip information. If I can ask you those booking forms back to us by next Friday, that would be amazing. That just gives us an indication as to who's interested. So, you know, it's, I'm not going to come chasing you and banging on your door for the money, but if you fill that form out, I'd hope you'd kind of be, you know, 90, 95 percent sure that you want to do the trip. Once we've got all those forms in, we can then finalise all the trip details and then we'll come to you directly and say, here's all the final trip details, your flights, your costs, everything you need to know. If you're 100 percent committed now, we're going to take a 300 pound deposit from you and that confirms your placement and then you get all your confirmation documents sent out. Then the payments are split thereafter into two. So your 300 pound comes off the balance and then your first instalment of 50 percent of the remaining balance is due 16 weeks before and then the balance is due eight weeks before. We'll do team meetings and things before you go away. We'll do like a Q&A session, get together, you know, run for all the trip details and then your tickets are issued two weeks before you go. Um, and then you'll be at the airport before you know it and heading off to South Africa. Here's the links which I'll leave up for a short time. Um, it's fairly straightforward. I'll remember that 4476. If you type Gap Africa Projects 4476, it will bring up um, the trip details for you. Um, and there's also the link to the booking form um, as well. And that is nearly bang on 35 minutes of me talking. Um, so I will finish there and open up to any questions. Thanks, Mark. That was that was great. Uh open for questions. Anybody just uh, unmute and yell them out. I would quite like to just add a bit to um, the sort of life changing aspect of the trip. Um, having come back from Africa, I think I've had such a new perspective on not just my career path, but life itself the people you meet out there have such a different perspective and so free and they do what they want to do and what they love and they go to work every day loving their life and seeing that and living it is is really inspirational um i also recently applying for jobs have found so many of the things i learn out in south africa are applicable to uk conservation and stuff that we can do over here and um applying for jobs in rewilding projects. I can talk about the skills I learned for tracks and signs and stuff like that. And it's really important stuff that is so easily translated to our own conservation in this country. Um, and I mean, I've contacted Gap Africa about going back already. And, <laughs> I, you know, I am so ready to go back and learn more. And yeah, yeah, it really was life changing. It has opened up a whole new perspective for me and I've learned so much practical conservation work that will put me in good stead for the future and help me get jobs as well so yeah Jazz um something that the students are shy about um, but it often does come up is um, how to fund the trip and I know you immediately had some ideas about fundraising um, maybe you could drop a few of those and maybe that will foment some questions <laughs> yeah well um, the big project that's going on at Zingela at the minute for the giraffe moving um, Peter sort of I guess set us a challenge. Um, he said that each uni if, if each university group who went this year raised a thousand pounds, then they would have the money covered um, for the whole project, which is pretty insane to hear. So I reckon that we can set up something to raise, you know, a bit more than that, and um, that money can also help go towards students that are struggling to pay for the trip and. You know, the bigger the fundraising, the, the more amount of money that we do raise, the more we can help. So, 
Yeah. Are you thinking about things like uh, bake sales, car washes, that sort of thing? Yeah, maybe that sort of thing. Or, I mean, because I've finished at uni now, so I'm back home. So, um, I don't know, we're going to have a meeting with Mark about possible other things. But, um, yeah, I'll keep you all updated on that. And, yeah. Self-organizing those things with the student union who are also aware of it, um, especially that aspect of uh, helping subsidize the cost for uh, for students that need it. Or uh, it's a lot of money, but mm -hmm. um, I, w I wish every student could come because it is a real neat trip. Any questions about this stuff? You need to sink it in. Everybody seems stunned. I think the way that I, th I think of the uh, questions about this trip as a statistician is a really long tail, almost no questions, and then a spike right towards the end uh, as people start thinking about it. <clears throat> the food and the accommodation is incredible. I have to say that, like, uh, the food is in insane. It's so good um, at both places, Zingera and Nambiti. Um, Creepy crawlies. You don't have to worry too much about creepy crawlies. And I have to say that towards the end, I was pretty brave. If I see so myself, and get over that sort of fear. Um, but yeah, so you don't have to worry too much on that front. And then, uh, like Mark said, camp life is just amazing. You just you could become so immersed in it straight away, and everyone's there to help you if you have any doubts or worries or you're feeling unwell. You just you feel so comfortable to speak up and talk to people about it so that's never anything to worry about um and I never felt unsafe everything was um you know everything felt felt great in that sense so I'm trying to think of questions that I had before I went I can so, think of yeah. a question. Oh, Oops, sorry. <laughs> no, go on, Megan. I, wasn't... Um, I was just going to say, obviously, you talk about um, breakfast, lunch and dinner. Um, and I volunteered with the National Trust for a while. And one of the mottos we had was never allow yourself to be separated from your lunch. Um, but <laughs> what that was making me think is in terms of if you were to have like additional snacks and whether it's possible to bring snacks with you or if that's an issue on like trails and stuff like that. Um, I think it's fine to, I mean, the food is plentiful, um, so you can fill your, your belly at the uh, at the right meals. But, yeah, you can bring your snacks um, from home. Obviously, it depends on diet requirements and preference and things. We do try, assuming flights aren't late coming in to, to Johannesburg, we will try and do a stop off um, at like a small supermarket uh, on the way down so you can uh, enjoy the delights of the South African no sugar restriction snacks that they have out there as well and their their fluorescent orange soda pops and things like that so yeah you can stock up and there's places to keep them when you uh when you get into camp yeah i think for breakfast most mornings we had what there was a main breakfast and then they have stuff and you can pack yourself a sandwich so if you were if you know you're going to be hungry throughout the day you can pack yourself four sandwiches if you want and take it with you and you're on on the boat um on the boat on the truck and that so yeah there's, there's definitely not a shortage of food you, you can bring all the snacks you want and there are opportunities when we're traveling to buy them the thing i would add to that is that um we'll be camping in tents with wildlife all around us so sleeping with your snacks and the sleeping bag with you is not advised because um, the animals can smell that. So the question that's unasked, which I will answer, is that you can every night store your snacks safely away from your body while you're sleeping. Mm. Don't do what Lock I did up. and leave an open packet of Oreos next to the bed and wake up to an uh, ant infestation. <laughs> that wasn't fun. The safest possible invader that I could think yeah. of. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> okay. Every uh, these young eager minds are all completely satisfied. Mark, you did a fantastic job. Thank you. No problem. Well, thanks for putting on the yeah the session, and hopefully those that couldn't make it can catch up on the uh, on the recording. And obviously, if there's any questions, you know, then then feel free to pop them through.
I will post this video uh, and and send a link through your course leaders. But, um, but actually, if you have any questions, if you do think of any, um, feel free to contact me directly by by email and um, should have my email on the invite to this that was forwarded to you. And I know Mark uh, will avail himself of any questions as well. And uh, you have the links and I will also in a follow up email um, in addition to posting the the video, I'll um, I'll post the links as well to the to the website. And um, please disseminate the information if you know people who might be interested. And the thing that hasn't been said yet is that it's open to uh, students, and we reserve the first <clears throat> right to go for students who are attending the module. But um, we have in past years opened it to other interested students, and um, there probably will be space for that this year. So I don't know if that applies to any of you or um, or if you know someone who might be interested, but um, that's OK. And if, if they have any questions, they can contact me directly and we'll uh, give them all the information. Okay, it's hitting that hour. Andy, are you uh, are you intellectually satisfied from uh, all the information you've gathered? Uh, well, I'm intellectually satisfied from my exciting day at the university, of course, Ed. But uh, no, that was really good. To, really good to hear. It looks 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 really good. I've been to a tented camp before in the middle of a predator area and uh, escorted to and from the dining area by a 12 year old who didn't look like he could fend any wild animals off. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it looks that looks really good. Okay, then. Uh, Thank you. Good night, everyone. And I'll see you later. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye.